Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part 54, two academical critics, book seven, some Christian students of the Kabbalah from the Doctrine and Literature of the Kabbalah by Arthur Edward Waite. 17. Two academical critics. Having regard to the fact that, as already stated, there has been always in England a certain number of persons who have been interested, mostly through sympathy with occultism in the study of the Kabbalah, it will appear almost incredible that there are no memorials of their interest between the period of Thomas Vaughan and the year 1865, a space of two centuries. There is a similar hiatus in the merely academical interest represented by Burnett. I do not say that there have been nowhere any references to Kabbalism. They have made up in number what they wanted in learning and authority. And a few valuable gleanings might be gathered from early editions of the larger cyclopedias. But as there has been no occult student who wrote anything of real moment concerning it, so there has been no scholar apart from occult interests who has treated the subject seriously. The work of Dr. Ginsburg, so well known that it scarcely needs describing, was epoch-making because it was the first clear, simple and methodized account of Kabbalistic doctrine and literature. It leaves naturally much to be desired, as it arose in an informal manner out of a meeting of some literary society in Liverpool, and the nucleus of the short paper produced for the occasion in question was afterwards expanded into a slender volume. It is a meagre measure to allot to so large a subject, but it was as much as could be warranted by the existing interest, which is sharply determined by the fact that a second edition was never needed. There is good reason to believe that it did not represent Dr. Ginsburg's knowledge at the period, yet it went much further than cyclopedic or theological notices. Uh, Dr. Ginsburg is therefore entitled to a place among the Christian students of the Kabbalah. And I purpose in this brief notice, which is mainly concerned with the standpoint, to connect him with the name of a writer who recalls him in France of today. Both, I believe, are accomplished Hebrew scholars, both of Jewish origin. Dr. Ginsburg is, however, a Christian and has done work in connection with the Trinitarian Bible Society, while Monsieur Isidore Loeb, so far as I'm aware, has remained in the faith of Jewry, and it is therefore only by way of contrast with his English prototype that I am warranted in referring to him in this place. There is a period of a quarter of a century between the two writers, and as their point of view is in general respects almost identical and indeed suggests that the French critic has profited by the English, it is interesting to note the one matter over which they diverge, namely the authorship of the Zohar. It has been objected against Dr. Ginsburg that he draws chiefly from continental writers, reflects their views and shows little independent research. His quotations from the Zohar are, it is said, derived from Frank and are open therefore to the harsh criticisms passed on them many years ago in Germany. These matters are of no importance to the reader who is in search only of elementary information whose purpose is served well enough by the translations of Frank and for whom a digest of authoritative criticism is about the best textbook possible. The fact itself makes Dr. Ginsburg's little treatise the English representative of a particular school of research, that of the hostile criticisms which refer the Zohar to the authorship, more or less exclusive, of Moses de Leon. In England, Dr. Schiller Zinnis's article on the Midrashim in the ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, referring the nucleus of the book to Mishnic times and regarding Simeon ben Yochai as the author in the same sense that R. Yohanan was the author of the Palestine Talmud, has helped to create another and more natural manner of regarding the Zohar. The critical objections of Dr. Ginsburg derive from the work itself have been equally disposed of in the majority of cases, and the few which still remain can establish nothing conclusively. They have been noticed briefly in Book 2, Section 3. If we take in connection with this the fact that Monsieur Isidore Loeb, who so closely reproduces Dr. Ginsburg, abandons the theory of unqualified imposture, we shall see that some progress has been made with the subject during recent years, and as it is one of the purposes of the present study to place the evidence of this fact before the English reader, I feel warranted in giving space to the following synopsis of Monsieur Isidore's Loeb's essay, as it may not be accessible to some who are acquainted with that of Dr. Ginsburg. There is a literary excellence in the one which is fairly precluded by the circumstance that called the other into being, and it is really a matter of regret 
that the sole contribution of Monsieur Loeb towards the elucidation of Kabbalistic literature occurs in La Grande Encyclopédie. Monsieur Loeb was, however, for some time president of the publication committee of the French Society of Jewish Studies. His other literary work comprises a monograph on the Jewish chroniclers, a table of Jewish calendars, and some observations on the situation of the Israelites in Turkey, Serbia, and Romania. In the essay with which we are here concerned, he records the opinion that the term Kabbalah may not be anterior to the 10th century, and that the claim to antiquity which it signifies is supported by no written monument. It seems difficult in the nature of the case that it should be so substantiated. Monsieur Loeb, however, makes a very proper distinction between the metaphysical or mystical Kabbalah and the gross thaumaturgy connected with the practical branch. To the original elements of the first, he ascribes, like all critics, a high antiquity, but not, as it need scarcely be said, of a kind which would permit it to be regarded as the perpetuation of an indigenous, much less an uncorrupted tradition. As we have had occasion to see, this claim is no longer made by any competent student of the subject. For Monsieur Loeb, the Kabbalah is a part of the universal mysticism which seeks to explain the disparity between an infinite God and a finite world by means of intermediate creations through which the divine power descends, diminishing in its spiritual qualities as it removes further from its source and becoming more imperfect and material. The difficulty is removed by this process much in the same manner as the difficulty of a terra firma for the elephant which supports the universe is disposed of in Indian cosmology by assuming the tortoise. In other words, it is not removed at all. At the same time, the explanation of emanationist mysticism, which is not all mysticism, as Monsieur Loeb seems to assume, is not in the last analysis open to greater objection than any other philosophic attempt to bridge the gulf between finite and infinite. Passing from this consideration, the French critic discovers the foundation of the Kabbalistic theory of metaphysics in the scriptural personification of wisdom and the chief elements of its symbolism in the prophetical books, about which points there is no question whatever, and they are matters of common knowledge. So also he refers correctly the name or catchword of the Zohar to Daniel 12.3. He cites the number of the beast in the Apocalypse as everyone has cited it before him as an example of gematria. But he raises a less hackneyed point by suggesting on the authority of Monk that Temura was employed by Jeremiah. He does better service by reminding us that the Essenians attach great importance to symbolical angelology and that each individual of that mystical fraternity was required to remember accurately the names of the angels. It is, however, among the Jews of Alexandria that, following several previous authorities, he discovers the germs of Kabbalistic mysticism. But in this connection, he cites only the Platonic doctrine of the Logos, its influence on the Greek Septuagint and on the Chaldee version of the Old Testament. On the whole, I do not think that Monsieur Lobert's critical faculty, or indeed his erudition, is at all comparable to his graceful synthetic talent. To cite a crucial instance, he dismisses one testimony to Kabbalistic tradition by saying, despite the contrary assertions of the Talmud, we refuse to believe that Johanan ben Zokai or his contemporaries devoted themselves to mystic doctrines or secret things. It is to the second century that he refers the ravages of Gnosticism among the Jews of Palestine and cites various subtleties of the doctors which arose at that period. He sketches the decline of the Palestine schools and the rise of those of Babylon, the traditional country of magic. He cites from Rab, the Babylonian of the third century, that passage which I have mentioned elsewhere and confesses that it is another germ of the medieval Kabbalah, that is, the doctrine of the Sephiroth. With a rapid pen, he runs over the great impetus given to Jewish literature under Arabian influence from the middle of the 7th century. He refers to the 9th century that all-important treatise entitled The Measures of the Stature of God, which is, in fact, as we have seen, the first form of the Zoharistic macroprosopus and is mentioned by Agabad. He places the alphabet of Akiba dealing with the symbolism of the Hebrew letters about the same period together with a crowd of apocalyptic treatises, including Perkavar Eliezer, which has an elaborate doctrine of pneumatology. Among all these, he distinguishes the Sefer Yetzirah as occupying a place and deserving a rank apart. 
He admits its comparative antiquity, seeming to regard it as immediately posterior to the Talmud, which he affirms to have been finished AD 499. He describes it as a philosophy and a gnosis and supposes it to have been written in Palestine under the direct influence of Christian and pagan Gnosticism. The opinion is interesting, but of course entirely conjectural. And as the doctrine of emanation is not very clear in the Sefer Yetzira, we should not accept hastily the theory of an influence which assumes it, when he observes further that its fountainheads must be sought in Azariel's commentary on the Sephiroth and in the Bahir. I fail to understand the grounds on which he attributes a superior antiquity to those works. He assigns to the Zohar itself a Spanish origin, but does not press the authorship of Moses de Leon. Among the fine points of his criticism is a picture of the pure Talmudists of the period of Maimonides, especially those of the peninsula and the south of France, living under the influence of Arabian philosophy, without philosophical doctrine, without perspective, having only the literature of the law and the anthropomorphic mysticism of the Jewish schools of northern France, between which the Kabbalah rose up as a mediator, completing Talmudism by philosophy, correcting philosophy by theosophy, and anthropomorphic mysticism by philosophic mysticism. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.